Mental Health Program and uh, is the, the host of Dr. America, the radio show. Um, and uh, Dr. Sriram has been very active in talking about what Medicare for All will mean for low-income communities, for communities of color, um, and he's been very interested in, in centering uh, discussions about racial justice um, and social justice more broadly within the Medicare for All discussion. So we're really glad to have him as our moderator today. Uh, thank you so much. If you, if you didn't sign in before the briefing, please sign in after, um, and we look forward to, to this discussion today. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you for this opportunity to moderate uh, what I think is going to be a really excellent panel. Um, my name is Dr. Sanjay Sriram. I'm a pediatrician in Anacostia, and very happy to be here. I am a relative newcomer to the Medicare for All fight, and um, my, my uh, journey to this cause was that I came to realize that my patients, uh, they benefited tremendously from the ACAs. Oh. It's not going to light up? Yeah, oh, okay, there we go. Okay. <laughs> okay, um, I came to, this, to, to the cause of Medicare for All mainly for the sake of my patients and families for whom I realized that the Affordable Care Act was important but insufficient. And I think that the more that I learn about Medicare for All and what it would mean to uh, predominantly minority and low-income communities and families, the more I believe in its urgency and the less I see it as a radical idea and more as just a necessary evolutionary step in American healthcare. Um, and to help us broaden the conversation about Medicare for All, we have an excellent group of panelists. I'm going to turn things over to them right now. And what I'm going to ask you to the panelists to do is that I'm going to, um, I'll pose the question to you, and if you can just introduce yourself um, as you answer the question, that would be great. So the first question I have is for Mark, uh, <clears throat> Mark Dudzik from the Labor Campaign for Single Payer. And Mark, my question for you is that earlier this year, the Supreme Court struck a major blow to workers' rights with its ruling on Janus. And I was wondering if you could walk us through what Medicare for All would mean for workers and their families in the current labor landscape. Okay, thank you, doctor, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I am Mark Dudzik. I'm the national coordinator of the Labor Campaign for Single Payer. Uh, we're based right here in Washington, D.C., uh, <coughs> and we do exactly what our title says. We move work to move... Uh, the national labor movement into this fight to win Medicare for all. So, the, doctor, your question is really right on target. Uh, you know, the rights of workers to organize and to bargain and to act in solidarity with one another are really facing existential threats right now. And there's, there's a whole series of reasons why that's happening and causes uh, and effects, uh, not least of which is a long-term campaign led by groups like the Koch brothers to undermine uh, the independence and the ability to uh, act on the uh, part of the American labor movement. But one aspect that we maintain has uh, seriously contributed to this crisis is the, the uh, fact that in this country, um, health care is linked to employment uh, and has in fact become an albatross around the necks of workers and their unions in this country. Uh, the fact that it's linked to employment is this kind of weird historic anomaly that I'd be glad to talk about if we had a lot of time. Um, but just, let me just say that there is no other industrialized country in the world um, that treats health care as a benefit of employment rather than as a fundamental right of citizenship of those of those societies. And it creates all kinds of distortions. Um, it creates what uh, some analysts have called a private welfare state that in fact, you know, there's huge amounts of money and resources that are allocated from public funds uh, into health care, but it's all in this privatized health care state. Uh, and unions have played um, a big role in building and maintaining that private welfare state because they really have no other alternatives to uh, to provide decent benefits for their members. And in fact, the best kind of health care benefits that working class Americans can expect come generally from uh, 
uh, workers who uh, are members of unions and uh, have access to union-sponsored health and welfare programs. And that's always been a source of pride for the American labor movement. And often, that source of pride has sort of drifted over into this idea that there's no other alternative, we would lose our reason for being um, if we gave up that right. But regardless of how you think about that as a trade unionist, the reality is that employment-based health care has simply become unsustainable. There's no way, whether you want to keep it the way it is or not, there's no way that we can continue to do it. There's a consulting firm called the Millman Associates that does employment-based uh, consulting. They put out an annual index. Uh, they have estimated that in this year, 2018, that a working class, employed working family of four with decent health care coverage, the total health care expenses for that family are now $28,166 per year. Uh, employers are paying $15,788 of that, and the family out of pocket f through contributions, co-pays, deductibles, all the other uh, hurdles that we have between us and our health care are paying an additional $12,378. So I'm an old union negotiator, so I always divide numbers like that by 2080, which is the number of full-time, uh, number of hours that a full-time worker would work in a, in a year. And uh, when you divide 28,166 by 2080, you come to $13.54 per hour. So this is a huge hurdle, and, and these numbers go up consistently two, three, four times faster than wage increases and other economic indicators go up year by year by year. Uh, so medical benefits are the biggest causes of strikes, lockouts, and concession bargaining in the labor movement. Anytime you look at a labor dispute in this country, I bet that when you delve into it, health care is at the center of it. Uh, it particularly affects low-wage workers. I mean, imagine the challenge of organizing hotel workers making 10 or $11 an hour. Not only do you have to negotiate a living wage and get them up to $15, $16 an hour, but you've got to come up with somewhere near $13 an hour to cover their health care coverage for their family, or else they'll be thrown into destitution, just maintaining regular health care expenses. So it's a particular challenge to them, but it's a challenge all the way up, uh, even to highly skilled and highly paid um, construction workers, carpenters, electricians, people who have excellent health care coverage, are based with fundamental competitive threats from other uh, companies in that industry who don't pay these kind of numbers for their health care for their workers, and then are undermined in contracts bidding, uh, um, and their, their health care funds begin to follow, go into a death spiral. So at all levels of the labor movement, this really has a, um, has a huge impact. So we lost, launched the labor campaign for single payer to begin to educate and address these issues. We have reached the uh, consensus, and most of the labor movement has reached the understanding that the time has come to take health care off the bargaining table by making it a right for everybody in America. Um, almost every union has passed resolutions um, um, supporting a Medicare for All or a single-payer style system, particularly supporting H.R. 676. Um, the AFL-CIO at its last three conventions has taken, uh, taken action on that. Our organization uh, includes 14 national unions um, and several dozen local and regional unions uh, as active members. Um, National Nurses is clearly probably the leading union in the country to, that advocates for health care justice and Medicare for all. Uh, nurses are just passionate about this issue. But this is moving throughout the labor movement. Our struggle right now, quite honestly, is to move beyond what we jokingly call resolutionary politics into really moving resources and organizing capacity into this fight. And more and more unions are coming to that understanding. And, uh, you know, that is what's really beginning to change the momentum around Medicare for All. And I'm hoping that you all will see in, in the coming year more and more union delegations showing up at your members' offices uh, raising this issue of H.R. 676 as part of their, their list of things that are very important to them. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. 
Uh, my next question is for Will Fisher from Vote Vets. And, you know, many of us assume that veterans get health care through the VA. And so we're curious about, you know, what the average veteran's take and stake is in Medicare for all. And why is this important to veterans when they, quote unquote, already have care in the VA? Absolutely. I would say that this is actually an issue that really we uh, talked a lot about during the ACA fight last year, where I would hear over and over, well, what, what a veterans care, aren't you all, all receive your health care through the VA? And the reality is, is that according to the VA in 2014, only about 40 percent of veterans were currently enrolled in the VA health care system. The VA, it's a world-class health care system. It is a health care system that is uniquely set up to meet the needs of, of veterans. But the, again, the reality is, is that the majority of veterans aren't enrolled in that system. They're not eligible for that system. They live too far away from that system, so on and so forth. So it can categorically be stated that if Medicare for All were to pass, it would be the single largest increase of veterans having access to health insurance in American history. On top of that, on top of that, veteran family members are very rarely able or afforded the opportunity to receive any type of health care coverage through, uh, through the VA. Therefore, again, if Medicare for All passed, not only would we see the largest increase in veterans being able to access to health care, but we would also see a huge increase in veteran family members, the mem family members of veterans being able to have access to, to health care. Now, I just want to say one other thing, because you bring up the VA. I think that everyone in this room is aware that the VA has been under attack, quite frankly, for some time. The president rails against it. There are some people in here who rail, you know, elected officials here who rail against it. The Koch brothers have their own front group, the Concerned Veterans for America, who call for it to be destroyed and privatized. Make no mistake about it. These attacks on the VA have nothing to do with improving health care for veterans. Nothing. The foundation of these attacks on the VA come down to the simple fact that the VA is a world-class health care provider, right? The VA, it functions well, but the VA is also a government-run, single-provider health care system. And those who are the, are the opponents of Medicare for All, they know, they know that step one in dashing the hopes of Medicare for All ever being realized in this country, step one in that fight is to destroy and privatize a single provider health care system that nine million people are are pretty damn happy with. So I'm here uh, with representing an organization called Vote Vets. We are the largest progressive veterans organization in the country. We have over 600,000 members in all 50 states. I'm a veteran. Uh, I served in the United States Marine Corps. I also, you know, carry this card around with me every day. It's my this is my VA card, and it is with this card that I have the ability to walk in to any VA facility anywhere in this country into this integrated health care system and have access to that world-class health care system that is uniquely set up to meet the needs of me and my fellow veterans. I know quite a few of you in here. I'm the lobbyist for Vote Vets, Director of Government Relations, and uh, you know I look forward to continue working with each and every single one of you um, to not only uh, make sure we have health care for more veterans, but we have health care for everybody in this country because we believe that health care is a right and not a privilege just for a very few. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Jennifer Flynn Walker from the Center for Popular Democracy. You know, to me, all is the heaviest word in Medicare for all. And it's because right now, 55% of America's 32 million uninsured are people of color. <coughs> so how do we make racial justice a bigger priority in Medicare for All? And if all means all, then what would Medicare for All mean for immigrant communities and for people with disabilities? That's a great question. Thank you so much. So my name is Jennifer Flynn Walker, um, and I work at the Center for Popular Democracy Action and for our sister organization, Center for Popular Democracy. And we're a network of 55 of the most badass organizing, community organizing groups in the country that have been working in communities of color and low-income communities around in 33 states now um, for really decades, many of them for decades. And, and a lot of them are credited 
with having run the field game or, or worked with Healthcare for America Now to run the field game to win the Affordable Care Act. And a lot of them got back into the fight, got reactivated, we got the band back together when Trump was elected uh, and when we knew that the Affordable Care Act was going to be on the chopping block. One of the first things, you know, day one he would repeal it. And they, together, we fought with everything that we had to fight back against that repeal. And so we actually thought, oh, maybe Medicare for All is not the fight that, that our affiliates would want to get into. And so we went to them and we said, you know, you guys have been big believers in the Affordable Care Act. And they were like, of course, we need, we need more health care. And we said, what do you think about Medicare for All? And they were like, finally, we can stop fighting for a system that is increasingly inadequate, is increasingly inefficient, and we can finally get to the for all part, because that's what our organizations are about. They're about meeting the needs of the people that are always left behind. Um, these are the groups that fight for, against predatory lending, for clean drinking water, for higher minimum wage. Um, we initiated one of the largest, I don't know if there is such a thing as the history of door knocking programs in the country, but if there was, we initiated the largest door knocking program in the country uh, recently. And when people have been going out and starting that program and they're just talking to people about the issues, they don't go always and say, you know, what, and ask a question about healthcare. But in every conversation, in every context, the need for a better healthcare system comes up. So we've got members who are in Arkansas, or uh, and you know when and they actually legitimately don't have a healthcare system. I mean, their healthcare system is rapidly deteriorating and crumbling. A lot of that, you know, a lot of the states where governors didn't opt into Medicare expand to Medicaid expansion, um, their healthcare systems are inaccessible. People literally can't get to the doctor. They can't find somebody who can take care of them. They have far fewer specialists. If they're on, say, Medicaid, which, you know, of course is a great program, if they're on Medicaid, they can't get to the same doctor that someone who's on private insurance can get to. They can't find the same specialist. They don't have that access. And I don't know, isn't that the definition of inequality, right? That I, as somebody who has employer health insurance, can go to, you know, the very best brain surgeon in New York and get my needs met, but somebody who's in Arkansas who is on Medicaid can't get have access to that doctor unless they're willing to pay an inexorbitant amount out of pocket. So, you know, let's be, I feel like it's useful to talk about the amounts of money. I mean, we're not talking like, well, if I put together all the money that me and my family had, I could get the cancer treatment that I need. We're talking about money that most of us could never even imagine if we worked a whole lifetime and we sold our house and we borrowed from friends and family. You know, that would get us the first stage of our, of our cancer treatment. It would not actually see us through to, to being able to survive. Um, and so this is what people will talk about. They say, we need, this system is great for now, like let's not lose it because we, we want to stay alive, and you know, CPD uses this framework that we call freedom to thrive. And, and it's, you know, what do we actually need to do to make sure that our communities, particularly low-income communities of color, can actually not just survive, although in this case we're talking about you need healthcare to be able to survive, but what do we need to be able to thrive? And, you know, when people say things like, where are you going to get the money to pay for Medicare for all? Well, we should increasingly say what now some new congressional candidates have started popularizing. Well, where do you get the money to pay for the new prison? Where do you get to pay for the money for the new police force that has, you know, tanks and super armor? We, let's take some of that money and invest it into health care because that's actually what we need in our communities for them to be able to, to really thrive. Um, even in states in New York, where I'm from, you know, there's amazing hospitals, great hospitals, right? Great, some of the best doctors. Uh, I don't know where you're from. Are you from here? <laughs> sure. I'm sure you're. <laughs> and DC has great, great doctors too. Um, but you know, even there, you have the mother who has a daughter with asthma, and you know, in one week, you could go through $800 in deductibles mm -hmm. and copays. And just that's one week of your life. I mean, who's got an extra, you know, maybe you can scrape together $800, but 
if it's something like that where it's going to be a cost that you're going to have to incur week in and week out or every couple months, that becomes unaffordable. And you hear all the time when you talk to people on the streets when we're canvassing, you know, people will say, I, you know, I couldn't go get my medicine today because I had to pay my rent. So, um, so one thing that we really want are excited about and we recognize is that it's not going to be for all unless it's really single payer, unless there's one, one system that we are all in together and that we are all invested in and that there's not a profit driven motive. We know that nobody is fooled to believe that there's going to be, you know, the JP Morgan, Amazon, and that somehow they're just in it for the goodness of their heart. Everybody knows that at the end of the day, there will be some kind of profit motive and that that profit motive will not be whether or not people in our communities are, are able to live. Right? So we're very excited to push as hard as we can for HR, 676 um, and we're actually doing something where we're bringing our affiliates every single Wednesday, Wednesdays in Washington, and they'll be roaming the halls and they'll be talking to many of you um, and hopefully many who aren't in the room uh, about, about how much we need Medicare for All and they'll also be doing creative actions and they'll also be in district back home meeting regularly at least once a month with their, with their district offices, with the people who make the decision. Um, and we're not going to give up, and we, we have a history of winning. So just like we won the Affordable Care Act, we're going to win Medicare for All, working alongside with this powerful and growing coalition. And I look forward to seeing all of you in the coming months and working with you. Thank you. Thank you. And next up is uh, Jasmine Jefferson from Social Security Works. And uh, the question is, how do we earn the trust and support of seniors who are skeptical about Medicare for All uh, because they've been told or misinformed that it could mean less Medicare for them? And you know, given the amount of long-term care that many seniors get from Medicaid, what do we tell them about the future of that long-term care? Sure. So again, my name is Jasmine Jefferson, and I'm the Legislative Director at Social Security Works. We fight to expand Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, as well as to lower prescription drug prices. And I appreciate the question, Sanjeev. It's a really important one um, to answer because there are a lot of seniors who've been lied to. Um, they've been told that Medicare for all is not beneficial to them. There's a um, there's a perspective that for some reason in this country we can't have health care for young people and old people at the same time when that's just that's not true. We can afford to have health care for everyone. And so we do have to answer that question to seniors and we have to be able to relate to them that no, Medicare for all is going to be good for you and it's going to be good for your family as well. So the media and policymakers, I know a lot of you have been watching the election on your off time um, and seeing that there are people running and, and pushing back against candidates who are running for Medicare for all. Um, and so we know in reality, Medicare in its current state, it works well for seniors. seniors love Medicare. It's really popular. They love that they get their health care. We know that before Medicare existed, seniors didn't have access to um, a high quality health care system. And so that's why they love Medicare and they should love Medicare. It's more efficient than any private health care system. The administrative costs for our current Medicare system are a little over a penny for every dollar is spent on administrative costs. Um, everything else is spent on beneficiaries. On the contrary, in private health in the private health care system, we spend anywhere between seven or eleven and seventeen percent on administrative costs. Anywhere up to thirty percent of every dollar is used on administrative costs. And of course, as Jennifer pointed out, the private health care market is about profit. And so the government runs health care better than the private market ever will. And so that's one reason that we can really push back against the narrative that Medicare for all won't work for seniors. Um, the other, and I think the primary reason to think about it working well for seniors is just universality. So just the very basic economic argument that when costs are spread across a broad range of individuals, 
that's when insurance works the best. It's the same thing that we talk about when we refer to Social Security. When we all pay in, we're all able to benefit from that system. Medicare for all would work in the exact same way. When we all pay into a system, we're all going to benefit from it. And it prevents adverse selection. So if you all are familiar with economics, people who are more likely to use the insurance. So if you are more likely to get sick, so say a senior or maybe someone with disabilities they'd be more likely to buy the insurance but that makes the cost high so um, to prevent those costs and to spread that cost amongst more people so for young people to join in for um, middle-aged people to join in that creates the cost lowering so that's why Medicare for all would work not just for young people it lowers the cost for seniors it lowers the cost for everyone and that's what makes it so important. So um, one thing that I, I think is important to note is that it has to be a single payer system. And so there are a lot of people trying to use Medicare for all in different ways where, where it's like, well, we'll have this one plan that's like piecemeal and well, you can keep your Medicare and we'll do something else with everyone else. But that's that doesn't that doesn't work like that. So Medicare extra, for example, that that doesn't that doesn't work. Everyone has to pay into the system in order for it to work. We have to have a comprehensive system for young people and old people in order for it to work. And that's I mean that's that's important to note because there are a lot of other plans in the mix that are not they're not going to work. So um, the other thing I would point out is is drug price reform. So when we do Medicare for all, because we will do it, we have to talk about drug price reform. And so traditionally we talk about Medicare negotiation and having the Secretary of HHS have the ability, ability to negotiate drug prices. And that is an incredible start. The Secretary should have the ability to negotiate drug prices just like other systems have the ability to negotiate drug prices but you have to have some sort of backbone to that to make sure that you don't put patients at risk. So um, traditionally, a, medic or a system that uses a formulary, for example, it's a list of drugs that we're willing to cover. Um, how pharmaceutical corporations fight back is they say, well, you know, I don't want to negotiate with you. Um, I'm not going to sell my drug to you at that price. And so now we're in this position where we don't include that on the formulary. The drug is not covered. Out-of-pocket costs skyrocket. And so you're, you're left with patients being put at risk because they're not able to have access to their medicines. And it's, it's unfair. People can die because of that. So to prevent that, we eliminate having to put the patient at risk. And now we're going to put the patent at risk by implementing something like a compulsory license or a competitive license as Representative Doggett has framed it. Um, there is a bill currently in the House, it's HR, I believe it's 6505. Oh, yeah, the Medicare Negotiation and, Compuls and Competitive Licensing Act by Representative Doggett. Um, that bill in particular is one of the first and it's currently, it's got 100 co-sponsors um, and is one of the most, it is the most popular, not one of, it is the most popular bill right now um, in reference to drug price reform for um, the House. And so, um, and it's only, it's only Democrats, just to be clear, only Democrats have uh, in, endorsed that. But the point is that a competitive license allows the government to step in when negotiations fail and say, because you will not negotiate with me, then, and we don't like your price, we will allow generic competition. And so the goal is never to get to the point to where you have to issue a competitive license, but it adds backbone and again, it puts the patent at risk and not the patient, so that patients are able to get the life-saving medicines that they deserve and um, they, they need to live. So that, again, is another reason why seniors should be able to easily <coughs> buy into a Medicare for All system because drug prices are way too high in America. We pay the, the highest drug prices in the world. And if we don't include drug price reform, then we're going to end up like Canada, um, a single-payer system with really high drug prices, and we don't want that. 
So I think the last thing you asked about was long-term care. Mm -hmm. And um, I won't go in too deep about long-term care, but the point is that in order to have a comprehensive single-payer system, we have to include long-term care. There are different ways we can do that and we can and talk about those, but the, the point is that you have to include long-term care in a system that works for all Americans. And so um, how I like to narrow it down is when, if you're ever in a situation where you're talking you kind of give lay out three options for them and so one option is that you can um you can cut benefits so republicans often talk about well medicare is out of control they blame medicare when it's actually high health care costs that are the problem so we can cut the system we can cut benefits and i can promise you seniors are not gonna they're not gonna tolerate cutting benefits we can leave the system the same and um i think it was mark who pointed out is Right now, that our system is unsustainable. It will not last in the state that it's in because healthcare costs are completely out of control. The private market is out of control, and people are trying to profit on on our lives. And so, again, we can we can cut benefits, we can leave our system the same, or we can have an expanded and improved Medicare for all system. And so. Again, I hope that that was helpful um, so that you all understand that seniors are, they have, they have so much to gain from an expanded Medicare system. And um, we really are excited here at Social Security Works for the upcoming year and the possibility for us to really push forward and pass this thing because we deserve um, a high quality healthcare system for all Americans. And so thank you all for your time and I look forward to answering any questions that you have. Great. And last but not least, we have Richard Master from the Business Initiative for Health Policy. Um, so Richard, you know that providing health insurance to employees can be a daunting challenge to some employers, and then you have other employers who don't seem to care. You have large corporate employers like Walmart, McDonald's, Amazon, uh, that offer no health benefits to their low-income employees and are pretty indifferent to whether or not they're going to get care from uh, Medicaid or the insurance exchanges. Um, and then you have other small and medium-sized employers who want to offer attractive health benefits to attract and entertain workers, but the costs of that coverage make business very difficult. So the question is, how does Medicare for All fit with that wide range of business in America? Well, it, it certainly, this, um, Richard Master, I'm, in addition to being a member of the Business Initiative for Health Policy, I'm the CEO of a mid-size consumer products company, MCS Industries, with 320 um, <coughs> workers and their uh, dependents in our health care plan. Um, and in response to your question, uh, Sanjeev, the, it certainly is a financial challenge uh, to employers who do it correctly, and many employers don't do it correctly or don't do it at all. Only 52% of American companies now provide health care uh, coverage. The very largest companies, uh, it's in the 90 percentile range. Uh, but for workers in, in operations, uh, startup operations, or companies that have 12 workers or less, only 22% of those employees are now getting health care. Um, Doing it correctly, we try to do it correctly at MCS, and, and we have very comprehensive benefits. Uh, we insure the f entire family. 20% of the uh, businesses that, that uh, do insure their employees only insure the uh, employee, not the family, which is uh, certainly problematic from a societal standpoint. Um, we have low premium share, which means that uh, uh, 20 to 22 percent of the premium is shared by the employee, which is relatively low. It's now 30 percent um, on average. And we have a low deductible. Uh, deductibles are a huge barrier to uh, accessing care. Uh, in the United States. Uh, you know, and frankly, our companies, uh, uh, a family plan, and this reflects uh, Mark's remarks, um, uh, a family plan 10 years ago was $12,000 and had no deductible. Uh, 
in 2018, we contracted with the insurance company. And every year we have an annual renewal, and I'll explain how that works. Uh, and and the, the premium was $25,000, but it included a $12,000 deductible for, uh, if multiple members of the family got, got sick. And that was not acceptable to us, and so we did a secondary insurance uh, level of insurance to insure the deductible. So now we uh, pay the insurance, but again, we're up at $27,500 to insure a family, and that's $13.50 or 54 cents that Mark was talking about, and is on par with the 28,000 that uh, you know, a, a, a family uh, is all in cost in this country, which is really outrageous. $13.50 an hour for a forklift driver that may make $20 an hour. Uh, and uh, overall, if you look at what our budget is, it's three million, approaching $3 million for, for uh, health care at MCS. It's 22 22 and a half percent of total compensation. And that's an important number to consider because with Medicare for All, with the planning that I've seen and work with economists to develop, we're looking at nine percent, nine and a half percent as a payroll deduction. That'll pay for it all. Okay? So let's, let's just... Um, how would this work, okay? How does it work now? It works that a, that employee that makes $40,000 a year actually costs $27,000 and he participates in that, that plan, in paying for that plan. Under Medicare for All, he would pay a percentage of income. If we were talking about 8%, let's say, or 9%, the employee may pay 25 or 2%. Of, of that, um, of his annual income. He may pay $800 or $1,000, and the, uh, the, the employer would pay 6 or 7%, which would be around $2,500, $2,800. Now, if he worked for a, if, if we're talking about a $250,000 income, the total cost premium or the total deduction, we're not talking about premiums here, please. The total deduction would be about uh, $20,000, $25,000 a year. Uh, so you can see that this is much more fair and more equitable to uh, workers if we base uh, the cost of health care on their income. Okay. Well, well oh, uh, sorry. I, I want to that continue. Was a pause. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's, if we could, let's look at where each dollar of uh, MCS's premiums go. All right. So every year we have a renewal, and the insurance company comes in and looks at our. We have four or five companies that are buying for our business. They're going to come in and look at our history of. Payments, of, they consider them losses. Uh, payments for hospitals, doctors, pharmaceuticals, et cetera, et cetera. They have a sweet spot. It's 70 to 75 cents on the dollar. If our uh, payments for care, actual care, are above, let's say, 72 cents, our premiums will go up the next year. If they're below 72 cents, they'll figure out a way to make it more expensive and we'll, we'll be, we'll, they'll keep our premiums. Uh, we've never really had a reduction in premiums at MCS in the 30, 40 years that we've, we, you know, I've been associated with the company. Well, that's 28 cents on the premium dollar that goes to the insurance company right off the bat. Medicare would cost four cents. The deduction would be four cents versus 28 cents. We'd save 24 cents of every premium dollar. How many premium dollars are there? 
1.2 trillion. And, and we haven't even addressed the administrative uh, gunk that is in the delivery of care side. It would cost another six cents. It costs now another six cents for MCS to, uh, as part of our premium, to, to, to pay for that administrative waste. Drugs, we're paying twice as much as, as other countries for drugs, four cents. In, the United, in Pennsylvania, the state where, where we, we are, uh, there's a, a cost containment council that uh, does a study of hospital economics. A day in the, uh, in the, in, in a, a day in the hospital uh, compensated through Medicare is 50%, is half the cost. That is uh, uh, under commercial insurance. So there would be uh, adjust, certainly would be substantial adjustments. We're talking about, from our perspective, 40 cents worth of waste for MCS, premium dollar. What is that 40? You, you guys are working on the macro level. I've just described a micro situation to you. Every dollar of premium is worth, every penny of premium paid at MCS is worth $12 billion on the macro level. We're talking about $480 billion worth of savings on the macro level that we can identify. And when you put in the savings that uh, an additional four cents of every dollar that's going into Medicare when they get to save uh, on prescription drugs It's part of this bill. Uh, we're over $500 billion. And where does that money go? Well, what is it going to cost to insure 28 to 32 million Americans that are uninsured? $70 billion. What is it going to cost to reduce substantially the $350 billion of out-of-pocket expense that is bankrupting 600,000 people a year in this country? We can, we can cut that by $150 billion and, and we'll have some funds left over. But we can also reduce overall through uh, a payroll deduction system, uh, the uh, overall costs of care on the, to our, uh, 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 you know, uh, working uh, folks in the United States. So this is not a costly program. This is, this is a, certainly a money-saving program, and many of our business people are recognizing that. What they're saying to you is that the healthcare system is the tapeworm in the belly of American competitiveness, and it's absolutely true. It's a runaway cost that Medicare for All brings under control and makes sustainable the cost, the healthcare system, economically sustainable. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, we have about 13 minutes uh, left, and I wanted to open it up to Q&A from the audience. Uh, my only request is, is that you ask your questions specifically to a panelist, just because we want to try to get through as many questions as we can. And so it's easier to do that if every panelist doesn't have to answer every single question. So um, with that, I'd like to open it up to the floor. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ellen from Congress. I'm the Chief's office. Um, I'll cop out and say whichever panelist wants to answer this, jump in. I don't, I'm not going to pick for you. Um, but one aspect that uh, we haven't heard discussed much around the Medicare for All issue is the access to reproductive health. Um, in a Medicare for All system and ensuring that something like the Hyde Amendment doesn't carry over from our current system, which you're talking about, you know, racial and socioeconomic justice really prevents a lot of women from having the full access to reproductive care. So can one of you guys talk about how you want to address that? Well, I'll just say real quickly, 
Um, that, that's a problem in H.R. 676 that we expect to be improved. Uh, the Sanders bill in the Senate uh, makes it explicit that the full range of women's reproductive choices would be covered. Uh, the labor campaign supports the, uh, uh, that improvement in H.R. 676. <laughs> Yeah, we need to improve it. Yeah, okay. There was an anomaly that happened in the early 2000s when the bill was first drafted. I don't think there's any real resistance to updating 676. Well, I guess we'll find out when the bill is we submitted next year. And I appreciate the question because, you know, I mean, if we're going to be talking about putting the all in Medicare for all, it, yeah. you know, it can't be that certain forms of health care are considered second class or a lower priority or are considered politically icky. And, uh, and I think eliminating Hyde is an important part of that. Next question. Yeah. Hi, I'm Matt. I work for the uh, Canadian Small Business. I wanted to ask Richard a question about um, the, the interplay with the business sector. Um, so uh, our understanding is that there's an extent to which healthcare costs serve as a barrier to entrepreneurship. <clears throat> Do you think that Medicare for All would effectuate a, or was, I should say this, would put downward pressure on that barrier? Or could you otherwise talk uh, about the interplay of entrepreneurship? Yeah, certainly, uh, it, certainly it would. I mean, people it, at birth would get a, a Medicare card, right? They'd get a card that would entitle them to, to health care. I mean, what we see in the United States is a phenomenon that, that is considered job lock, where uh, uh, employees stay in jobs that they don't like because they need care. They need care for their families. And so they don't take, I mean, they're, they're willing to take the financial risk, but uh, the health care risk is, is really too dramatic for them. So that's a good point. If I could follow up on that, do you think that this is a message that as we move into the next Congress and looking toward the 2020 election, that this is a message that you think will resonate with disaffected moderate Republicans and independents who are looking at other options? Going we to are election? seeing that. You know, we're, we're seeing now that, that uh, in the recent Reuters poll that, that Medicare for All is polling above 50% support for it, which we didn't expect to see this soon in our campaign. Right, Mark? That's correct. That's <laughs> so uh, I, I think it's very encouraging. Uh, overall, we're seeing at least the initial response at 70% of the American population. Uh, what's great also is that people really understand the concepts. They, For some of us who've been in this movement for five or six or 10 or 15 years, where you know I've been concerned that the American public isn't wasn't getting it, they got it, and it's a combination of of the work that's being done by these wonderful people, but also the the level we've reached the tipping point, the level of suffering in the United States mm -hmm. is palatable. In my own uh, operation, it's really difficult to deal with employees who have financial concerns, um, uh, you know, about health care. <clears throat> yeah. uh, Kimo Freeman, we have Grayo's question for Ms. Flynn. Um, how do we educate the public to distinguish between health insurance and health care? Um, a lot of people think they are okay. Uh, my sister, my deceased sister, was in a car accident and uh, she was rushed to the hospital, and her insurance policy says because she's conscious, they didn't have to do a full body examination. They don't have the service for complaint areas. And unbeknownst to them, she had internal bleeding, and she collapsed in the home um, months later and, and died as, as a result of that. So she would be here today if they hadn't had a profit motive to um, save money for those people who would be okay in normal circumstances. If she had a full examination, they would have felt that and, 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 and leave it. So she thought she was okay. Uh, a lot of people today think they're okay because they don't know the difference between health insurance and health care. How do we address that? Well, uh, no, but Jen, you were, uh, the question was asked to you, so go for it. Um. I mean, I think that we see this in example after example after example after example and tragic examples of how our current system is, you know, it's 
it's not just that it's expensive, it's not just that people don't have access to the same level of care, it's not just about equity, it's also that our system actually gives us bad health care at every level. We don't get the health care that you get in other countries. We don't get the health care that we need to stay alive. We don't get the health care that we deserve. Um, and it is because, you, you answered it, it's because it's driven by profit. So you're always going to get, you know, the sort of cheapest, weakest care that someone can provide to you unless you have an incredibly savvy advocate doctor who gets in there. But, you know, if it's in a hospital setting that's fast moving and, you know, where you don't really have time to, to fight with an insurance company. I mean, I think all of us have probably spent, you know, more than an hour on a phone with an insurance company trying to get access to medicine, trying to get a, a procedure approved. Um, just, you know, imagine you can't have, you know, busy emergency room doctors doing that, but that is what our system relies on. It relies on some savvy advocate doctor to, like, do it if it's up to the you know, what happens, what the insurance company approves, then, then you do get the kind of, you know, you just get the, the top layer. And I think to answer your question about what we do about that, it's we organize. We, you know, we start to talk, we talk to people, we knock on doors, we canvas, we ask them, what are the problems in your health system? And they all, you know, there's lots of stories like that. And by the way, I'm very sorry for this, but that's an awful, awful story. Um, and yeah, so I think that it's just that we, we organize, we talk to people. People have the answer. Like they come to, what if we were all in the same system? What if the government just paid for it? Very quickly, you should probably listen to them. And, you know, I mean, if I can chime in, I, I see exactly what you're describing all the time. And I think that one of the responses I would have is that we just need to call out our system for what it is, that we trap people in false choices all the time that people are always facing a false choice of you can have your health or you can have your wealth you cannot have both so what is it going to be and for people with struggling incomes they make really smart financial decisions that end up costing them their health and then they get crapped on for being irresponsible and when in fact no they were actually tremendously responsible they were fiscally responsible with their, you know, with their family's dollar, because they understood that if I go to the doctor, I'm going to face a bill, and I can't, fi and I can't have that right now. So I'm going to make the smart financial decision of keeping this dollar with me today, and struggling through everything else. And I think that what people that these stories need to just be acknowledged as false choices, and instead of judging people for making these smart financial choices, we need to call them out as smart financial choices in a rigged system. That labeling the, you know, people as irresponsible when in fact they did the most responsible thing that they could with the limited money that they have, I think that that, that actually is what needs to be described in its complete naked honesty, not to keep falling back on whether somebody's being personally responsible or not with their health. Any, uh, yeah, in the back? This might be for Richard. How, how do you deal with people in the gig economy? Well, they would also. Uh, you still have on? Oh, I'm sorry. You still have on? Everyone would have a Medicare card. If you go to Canada, they have a card. They, so that would, that would entitle them to, to services. I think what you're questioning is how do we tax their compensation? Yeah. So there would have to be devised a, uh, a system of, of uh, taxing income from all work, regardless of whether or not it was salary or hourly work. And there could also be a taxation, taxation on dividends and capital gains if that was the principal source of income for, uh, for some folks. Good question. Yeah, I, I have, my name is Tony Matthews. I'm from Congressman Alcee Hastings' office. I'm a fellow actually with his office, and I'll be wrapping up my fellow for one year. But it's one of the eye openers that I share with a lot of people because healthcare is part of my portfolio is the recent uh, budget exercise we went through back in March where the budget, the Omni Plus budget, 
was approved for uh, 1.2 trillion. And when you look at this chart here, and I'm not sure if everyone can see it, but when you look at the events, which is the largest budget, I mean, the largest for discretionary spending, and then when you look down here, we you have Labor, Health and Human Services, and Education, which is only $177 billion. The issue I'm pointing out is our priorities. So, not, and I'm a vet myself, so I understand what you're talking about. But my point is, is not to negate that defense is not important, but we really need to hold members of Congress as well as ourselves uh, hold ourselves accountable in terms of putting the pressure on in terms of what are the real priorities because when you look at labor, people just want a quality job, health care, they just want not only access to it, but they want quality health care and then a quality education. Mm -hmm. That feeds back into the economy. Mm -hmm. So again, I just wanted to point that out in terms of what the priority is. <laughs> Again, my name is Will Fisher with Bobets. I think the point you made just now is uh, entirely accurate. It's not a question of what we can and can't afford. It's what people up here choose to prioritize. Uh, you know, I mean, when Donald Trump launched a couple dozen missiles into an empty airfield in Syria, I didn't hear people say, how are we going to pay for that? <laughs> Yet when we say, hey, I think that, you know, kids in elementary school ought to have access to food. Or people that have access to health care, people are like, I don't know how we'll pay for it. So it is. It's a, it's, a, it's a question that people are very selective in asking. And if you take a look around here, uh, you know, they all tend to usually fall in the same camp. And uh, I, yes, so to answer your question, yes, it is not a question of what we can and cannot afford. It is what people up here choose to make uh, priority. You know, I think the only, what I would add on to that is that we also need to ask, like, where is the money going? Like, the money that does go to healthcare, like, where does it actually go? Um, I started medical school in 1999, and, you know, when you look at the Kaiser Family Foundation data on, you know, um, health insurance at that time, uh, it's $6,000 from an employer, 2000 from the employee. Uh, it's 2017 was the most recent data that they had, and it's 6,000 from the employee, and it's 18,000 from the employer. Um, worker contributions to health insurance, it's cumulatively increased 270% in the exact same time frame, right? I can tell you that since I started medical school, like, we are not doing anything in healthcare that is 270% better. Like, I mean, we're, like, we're doing some things better, we're not doing 270% better. Like, we're just simply not. And I can tell you that there's nothing that justifies, you know, depriving families of, of, their, of their money, of their effort. Um, the question about entrepreneurship, it's, it's old data, but it's worth looking at. When CHIP was enacted in 1997, there was a spike in entrepreneurship. And, you know, like the late 90s, everybody attributed the entrepreneurship spike to the dot-com boom. But what they were, what, when they looked at some families with children, what they were finding was that parents were betting on themselves because they didn't have to get into job lock with a job that they weren't interested in. They were willing to take a bet on themselves because Chip was gonna take care of their kids. I can only imagine that if you start telling people that we're not going to you know, blow away your hard earned income, that what chances would people take on themselves? You know, I mean, and even from a physician standpoint, we're spending, the average American doctor spends Three weeks of every working year is spent arguing with the private insurance industry. That's not, that's three weeks that is not making any of my patients healthier. It's not three weeks where I'm becoming any smarter. I'm not, you know, like there's no education in any of that for me, you know, and it's certainly not like I'm getting anything out of that three weeks personally, right? Like I don't get like, you know, vacation out of it. I don't get to fight burnout out of it. None of that, right? So it's three weeks, and because time and money, it's all on one continuum, that's just time burnt, money burnt, that didn't make anybody healthier. And so what I like to challenge my physician colleagues when it comes to Medicare for All is that I like to ask them, what would you do with your three weeks? 
what would you, like, would you see more patients? Would you do more continuing medical education? Would you take time off with your family and kids, avoid some of that physician burnout? I'm not going to tell you what to do with three weeks, but to me, I'm mean, like, there are tons of things that you can do with three weeks that is any day better than arguing with an insurance company to get paid for services that you already did. The work is already done. You are begging for money on work that you already did. No other sector of the American economy puts people through that. And so the, that's, I mean, that's a huge part of why I've come to you know, Medicare for All is that I no longer have faith in an insurance industry that, you know, continues to put profits before my patients. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't believe that my time spent arguing on the phone yelling at them. It's a great stress relief. I'm not going to lie about that. <laughs> but I mean, but it, it's simply not of any benefit to my individual patients or to the system at large to lose that kind of time and effort. Um, I think we're a little bit over, but I know I just took a little bit of time right now. Does anybody have any other questions before we close? Hi, yeah. sorry, just really quickly. Um, my name is Michelle, I work for Congressman Adams. Um, just to play devil's advocate here, mm -hmm. um, what about the argument of, you know, the fact that we might overhaul the system is resulting massive job losses and, you know, kind of economic impacts um, to the healthcare industry? Like, could you talk a little bit more about the argument against mm -hmm. that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I do come back to that three weeks of, of physician right. time. So at least within healthcare, I think that you would see more productivity from physicians. Um, I usually get a, a similar question about like, well, what about, you know, physician pay? Like, I mean, like, are you really prepared to take a haircut? Um, and, and some people label it as a scalping. It's dramatic. But what, what I would argue is, is that um, it is important to, dip, to know the difference between primary care, which does, I would consider the heavy lifting in American healthcare, and subspecialty care, which does some lifting, but I mean, the majority of Americans need primary care first. Primary care, you would see that their, their incomes would actually stabilize. It's that, like, for many pediatricians, like, it actually means a pay raise because Medicaid pays less than Medicare, and now you're getting a bump up to Medicare rates. So that's a pay increase because the overwhelming majority of children, you know, that are on Medicaid to get a Medicare rate would be a pay increase. The time spent arguing with the insurance industry is money lost. And I think that people fail to understand that whatever you may think the insurance industry is doing for you in a higher pay compared to Medicare or Medicaid, you are losing all of that every single time you get on the phone because you had to hire somebody in your office to do that arguing for you. You had to do that arguing to back them up. It's money lost. So to me, I think that you would actually have stable income and you would have like more productivity from the, the health workforce. Um, as far as the other sectors of the economy, I'll defer to the panelists. Could, could I just add that it's important not to underestimate the impact of that transition on workers, particularly on lower level workers. Uh, we've seen how that's played out in, in debates about moving from an energy intensive to a green economy, and it's played out in some very ugly ways. And if we don't address that up front uh, and make sure that there's adequate provisions in this health care legislation to provide a just transition for workers who, through no fault of their own, are in occupations that will be affected by a transition to a more rational system, we will reap the consequences of that in some ugly politics. So this is the, uh, this is the time, I think, that we really need to step up and really uh, address those concerns. So I think it's a really, it's a very smart question to raise that now. And I hope all of your bosses are starting to think about those issues and have some answers when their constituents come in and ask them those questions. And then um, I think Richard had something to add. There are 500,000 folks working, over 500,000 folks working in the health insurance industry. Um, now, some of those folks are going to be required in, to return to the provider of care side of the equation because th there will be a surge of, of, uh, of folks, people who are, aren't, aren't uh, insured right now, through the 30 million, plus there's another 40 million who are underinsured who have high deductibles and are not using the system properly. So there, there is going to be a utilization bump. 
which would will require empl employment. But there, there certainly has to, and I think the question is great. We have to uh, recognize, and, and some of the, the bills, I think 676 does have a, uh, a transition um, uh, you know, uh, allowances, and, and I think for two, three years. So, uh, but it has to be considered, thanks. All right, I want to uh, thank everybody for attending this panel. Um, we're going to make ourselves available now and in the future for everyone. But thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it. Just a quick note, if your boss hasn't joined the Medicare for All caucus yet, you should talk about it with them. And if your boss is not a co-sponsor of HR 676, now is the time. Myself, Jasmine Jefferson, Egan Camp from Public Citizen, Social Security Works, and you are always available.